is Ask Me Anything today here on Jimmy Rants Fasting Edition. So all questions all about fasting, click on that little box down in the corner to watch this on IGTV for Jimmy Rants. JimmyRants.com is the website and as always you can engage live in the content but you gotta go follow me. I'm over on Instagram. I'm at Livin Low Carb Man, L I V I N L O W C A R B M A N. Once you're there, engage live uh, and participate, especially today. It, it isn't Ask Me Anything. Literally, ask me whatever you want about fasting. We simulcast over here on my Facebook page. So, thank you guys for being here. Mitzi and Rhonda and Norma, thank you all for being here today. And finally, to my wonderful YouTubers here on the live stream. And Shirley, of course, is here, as she always is. Thank you for your faithfulness, and thank you, everybody, for being here today on Jimmy Rants. If you missed the live here on Instagram, be sure to watch it on replay on IGTV. It usually goes up pretty quick after we get off the show uh, at the end of this show. We go Monday through Friday, 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Uh, we usually throw in some other ones as well, but almost always 11 a.m. Eastern, Monday through Friday. You can also watch the replay over on YouTube. Just type in a keyword, Jimmy Ranch, you'll find the show. Finally, you can uh, check out all the past episodes, over 500 and counting now, over at JimmyRants.com. And while you're there, if you like what we do here uh, and enjoy the show, you can support the show. Click on the Patreon link and... Uh, throw us a few pennies, we'd certainly appreciate it here today. But guys, it's Friday, and my tradition on Jimmy Rants on Fridays is to do an Ask Me Anything. So literally anything you want to ask me uh, is usually on the table. Well, today let's limit it to just fasting questions, since this week we've been doing a seven-day fasting challenge. We are currently in day number five, for those of you who are still participating. Uh, and we have a great book to tell you all about fasting called The Complete Guide to Fasting. I'm one of the co-authors with Dr. Jason Fung. Uh, if you want to learn more about fasting, uh, we answer a lot of the questions in there. Um, but yeah, uh, I ended my fast at hour 52 uh, and we'll try again probably sometime in the month of July. Try another fast, probably post 4th of July. I'll probably try to do another seven day fasting attempt. Uh, this week just was too stressful for a lot of reasons. So get your questions ready. I definitely want to answer any questions that you have about fasting. Uh, and I got a few that came in. Uh, let's take a look here. I think I saw at least one. Yeah, I got one uh, that came in before the show from my story up on Instagram. So, but before we get to your questions, so start writing them, write your questions. I want to see your fasting questions. I've got three different stories all about fasting that I thought would be of interest to talk about here at the beginning. This first one is from aa.com. Fasting beneficial in the time of COVID-19, according to an expert. And this is out of Samson, Turkey. Dr. Yusuf Uzun is an internal medicine and gastroenterologist specialist. And he said having a strong immune system is the most important protective factor against COVID-19 apart from measures such as a mask, washing hands, and social distancing. He underlined that hunger triggers autophagy or protective uh, cell care in healthy people who do not have additional uh, disease. And autophagy is the body's way of cleaning this up. He notes that the Nobel Prize in 2016 in uh, physiology and medicine was from a Japanese scientist named Yoshinori Osumi, who won it for his work in looking at autophagy, and that he's shown that time-restricted eating, otherwise known as fasting, has an effect on cell renewal and slowing aging in the body. Therefore, at the end of a 10 to 15 hour period of fasting, the immune system cells regain a stronger vital physiological balance and rejuvenate by refreshing and show a more resistant and protective effect against cancer and infections in general. Although further studies are needed, it's been understood that the cells in the body are rejuvenated by renewing and restrengthening in going on regular periods of fasting. So isn't that interesting? Um, remember COVID-19? It used to be a thing in the news. I, I, we don't hear much about that anymore, but it, it's still a thing. They're writing articles about it, but fasting beneficial uh, in as much as it helps to boost your immune system for the reasons we just shared. So that, I thought that was really interesting. 
Another article is about how to get rid of visceral fat using intermittent fasting to lose belly fat. Uh, and the bottom line there is just when you're lowering insulin and you're keeping insulin low, then that helps you tap into visceral fat. You're eating fewer meals in a tighter window with an intermittent fasting. Uh, you change your hormones, which can facilitate in weight loss. Uh, it could actually boost, uh, short-term fasting can help you boost your metabolic rate by upwards of 14%, uh, which then lets you also tap into a little bit of the autophagy where we were just talking about in the previous story. So all good things. It also reduces insulin, increases growth hormone, enhances uh, epinephrine signaling, and gives you a boost in your metabolism. So that's good news for those of you who have stubborn belly fat, intermittent fasting seems to do the trick. And then finally, and then we're gonna to come to your question. So if you just joined us, it's an Ask Me Anything fasting edition. Definitely ask your questions right down there of what you wanna know about fasting and we will get to those here in just a moment. This last one is from uh, phys.org. Scientists discover how cells respond to fasting. And so it looks at intermittent fasting, alternate day fasting, and various periods of calorie restriction. Uh, and so a team of researchers led by Professor Ionis Nezis from the School of Life Sciences at the University of Warwick has discovered how cells activate autophagy genes during fasting. He wrote a paper called Regulation of Expression of Autophagy Genes by ATGAA Interacting Partners Sequoia YL1 and SIR2 in Drosophila. That's a lot of like scientific gobbledygook to say, look, cool things coming from autophagy. Uh, it was published in the journal Cell Reports on May the 26th, um, and they discovered proteins which are required for the transcription of autophagy genes. So the proteins are called Sequoia YL-1 and SIR2, SIR2. These proteins interact with the cytoplasmic autophagy-related protein called ATG8A, and it's these interactions that recruit ATG8A in the nucleus to control the transcription of autophagy genes. This was the very first study, you guys, that uncovered a nuclear role of the cytoplasmic protein ATG8A. The lead author stated understanding the molecular mechanisms of activation of autophagy genes during fasting will help us to use interventions to activate these pathways to maintain a normal body weight and promote healthy well-being. I certainly hope this means that they're going to codify the use of fasting as a medical treatment uh, rather than trying to mimic the effects of what fasting does in some kind of a pill. Um, this is usually what they do when this kind of research happens. Like, well, we now know the mechanism. Let's create a pill that mimics that effect of that thing. We don't want to do that fasting, but fasting has some powerful, powerful uh, impacts on your body. Pretty cool, huh? All right, ask me anything. Fasting edition, ask away your questions. I'm going to get to this one question that came in ahead of time here on Instagram, and then we will get to your questions here on Instagram first. So this is the first question here today. What is your opinion on OMAD? Is it a good way to lose weight? So OMAD stands for one meal a day. Uh, and basically it means you're eating one meal and then not eating again until about 24 hours later. And so I love OMAD. In fact, I practice probably OMAD quite a bit in my ketogenic lifestyle. It almost happens automatically that I end up eating one meal a day. Um, I'm not obsessive about it. If I'm hungry and I want to eat a second meal, it's no big deal. But for people who are purposely trying to go that 24 hours between meals, that's what OMAD is. So is it a good way to lose weight? You know, I, I'm so over the goal of a nutritional approach being weight loss. If that's your goal, good for you and please do it. Yes, you will probably lose weight doing this. But let's look at what you're eating in that one meal. Are you eating a bunch of crap? Probably not because you're watching Jimmy Rants. Are you eating a well-formulated ketogenic diet with adequate calories? Okay. Or are you carnivore and you're going to have like a, you know, a couple of ribeye steaks? Okay, great. If that's something you want to do and your purpose is weight loss, fine. 
I think you're missing the point of fasting if you are doing it for weight loss as the primary goal. I think your primary goal of doing a one meal a day is giving your pancreas a break and being able to go um, and, and get your blood pressure down, your blood sugar down, your fasting insulin down. These are the benefits that I think all are important. And thus, as a result of those things coming into line, your weight will come down. I, I think sometimes we put the cart before the horse that weight loss is an interesting thing, but it's not even close to being the main thing in my opinion. But yeah, I'm a big fan of OMAD. I think OMAD is a great way to uh, ease into fasting if you've never fasted before as well. Push your body to go 24 hours, but get keto adapted and then try OMAD. So yeah, big fan. Thank you for that question. All right, let's go here. JimmyRance.com, by the way, is the website. Alice says, going to do some fasting next week. Better timing for me based on my cycle. Yes, listen to your cycle, ladies. If you're in the midst of your period, you do not want to be fasting for all the obvious reasons. Hope you're doing well. Sorry you had a bad week. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's better now, um, but it was tough earlier. Jillian says, still going strong today on day number five. My blood sugar is currently 74 and my ketones are four. That's awesome. You go, girl. Um, Scotty, you are doing a great job. Keep up the great work. Love all the podcasts and all these rants. Well, thank you. I, I love doing them. I really do. All right. Well, thank you, Instagram Live. Keep the questions coming. I definitely want to answer your questions all about fasting, so keep them coming. I'm going to pop over now to my Facebook page, see what you guys have to say and what questions you have about fasting. Keep them coming because we got a whole lot of time left here today on Jimmy Rants, and I definitely want to get to all your questions. Tammy says, I do intermittent fasting 18 to 20 hours every day and I'm always freezing, but I'd rather be cold than sick. Yeah, Tammy, um, definitely it sounds like you are a candidate to run your full thyroid panel. Now, if you go talk to your doctor and say, hey, I want to run uh, my thyroid, he might run TSH, uh, T4, and T3. That's the usually the three. If they're going to do three, that's the three that they do. But you miss reverse T3, you miss thyroid antibodies. You miss, there, there's so many other markers that you could get a complete thyroid panel. And if your doctor won't run them, uh, depending on what state you live in, you can have these run yourself uh, where you can go to anylabtestnow.com, privatemdlabs.com. I know these sites have the complete thyroid panel. If you're having coldness just from intermittent fasting, um, that's generally a sign that you may have some thyroid issues going on. It's nothing to worry about if you've got thyroid issues, but it is something to be aware of that that's why you're feeling cold uh, when it's starting to get warmer. So definitely have that run. I would uh, be very interested to know maybe you have some uh, hypothyroidism going on, maybe not necessarily autoimmune related, uh, which would be Hashimoto's, but there are non-autoimmune uh, hypothyroidism kind of issues. So get that checked out and that might be the reason why you're cold. But yes, intermittent fasting making you cold better than being sick. I agree with you. All right. Thank you, Facebook. Keep the questions rolling, you guys. we got a long way to go here in this episode. So let me go over to my YouTubers. What's up, guys? Shirley says, my husband insisted that intermittent fasting is a type of calorie restriction. Even if you're eating the same amount of calories when you eat, this sounded wrong to me. What's your take? Great, great question, Shirley. I, I addressed this one a little bit yesterday. People make the mistake that fasting is just calorie restriction. Can I tell you, calorie restriction is a fed state because calorie restriction is not no calories. Calorie restriction is under eating calories below your basal metabolic rate. So if you're under eating calories below your basal metabolic rate, you are eating, but you're not eating enough, okay? So your body is fooled into believing that it's feasting day. This is why I'm not a fan of people having bulletproof coffee. I'm not a fan of people having bone broth or any other form of calories, unless they're extraordinarily limited in those calories, definitely under 200 calories you go over 200 calories, you're telling your body, you're sending a signal clearly to your body 
that you are supposed to be eating that day and it turns on all the everything. Woohoo! Here we go. We're going to be eating. We're going to be eating. We're going to be, why aren't you eating, human? You need to be eating. And you don't eat. Okay? Your body says, all right, we got nutrition, but the dummy up there isn't telling, isn't giving us more nutrition. But we've already got like 400 calories. Way, way, way below what we need, but we're trying to send him signals to give us more food, but he's just not doing it. So that is a far worse effect than if your body gets no food at all, which is pure fasting, the water and salt like we've been doing this week, and your body's like, okay, all right, sounds like he's giving us a break. We're getting a little bit of a vacation. We're getting a paid vacation here today. The pancreas gets to stop pumping out insulin so much and thus insulin falls. Inflammation falls. Your basal metabolic rate, rather than slowing down from a hypocaloric state, from calorie restriction like your husband was talking about, actually gets boosted by not eating at all. Now that seems so odd that it's better to eat zero than it is to eat four or five or 600 calories, but that is true. You're gonna get a, a boosting effect. You're gonna get growth hormone starting to develop. Um, so many good things happening when you don't eat food. But the moment you put calories in your mouth in any form, and yes, liquid calories is still calories, people think, well, I'm only drinking Bulletproof coffee. That's not cal. Yeah, it is. It's still nutrition. You don't have to have a bite on it for you uh, to be getting calories in your body. And calories are the antithesis of fasting. So if you're going to fast, fast. If you're going to feast, feast. But don't try to be somewhere in between. So yes, uh, calorie restriction actually slows down your metabolism and forces you to eat less calories um, over time. And if you go too many calories over that less calories, you start gaining weight and it could be a very low amount of calories. This is what happened to the Biggest Loser contestants. They kept lowering calories, lowering calories, lowering calories while still having a very high energy expenditure with all the exercise and their basal metabolic rate fell significantly so. They would have been better off if they didn't eat any food at all on those days that they calorie restricted. So no, your husband is wrong to say that fasting is just another form of calorie restriction. It's not even in the same ballpark of what you're doing, but thank you for that question. I told him it was about the glucose and insulin response, and that's why people lose weight. Last time I checked calorie restriction was when you cut your calories back. Yes. Uh, Marie Louise says, would doing a fat fast get a person into being fat adapted quicker? So let me say something about fat fast. A fat fast is not a fast. I almost hate that they use the term fast with something like a fat fast. So, so for those of you that don't know what fat fast is, it's where you have uh, very, very high amounts of fat in very small little meals that you eat maybe 200, 250 calorie meals about four to five times a day. So it's just like a handful of macadamia nuts. That would be a meal. Um, and so the purpose of a fat fast, again, it's not fasting like what we're talking about here, uh, but a fat fast would definitely kickstart ketosis and get you into a well uh, fat adapted state, which you could then transition into a ketogenic state, which you become fully keto adapted and then start fasting. So yeah, I'm a fan of fat fasting, but it is not fasting as what we're talking about here today on the show. But thank you for that. All right, thank you, YouTube. We're gonna come back over here to my Instagram page, see if you guys have questions. Again, if you joined us late, we are doing an Ask Me Anything fasting edition here today. We are in the midst of a seven day water fasting challenge. This is day number five. By the way, I will be here on the weekend doing more fasting content Saturday and Sunday. So uh, if you're still hanging in there and still doing the fast with us, uh, don't go anywhere. I'm not going anywhere, I'm still here. So. Let's come back to you guys, see if you've got any questions. Kelly says, I'm so curious to see research comparing a 100% all meat diet with forced fasting to an all meat diet with forced fasting. Um, has that been tested research sufficiently in your uh, opinion? Uh, comparing 100% all meat diet with, oh, without forced fasting to an all meat diet with forced fasting. I don't like the idea of forced fasting. Like, you mean forcing the people to like go periods of time without 
eating versus seeing if they naturally get satiated by the all meat diet. I, I, I'm not aware of any research if that's what you're asking uh, that's been done, but my prediction would be most of us who eat kind of an animal-based foods diet primarily, and I know you do, Kelly, uh, typically you'll have your meat and you go many, many, many hours without eating, not forced. Um, but I would think that somebody that's already been on carnivore or already is keto adapted for a period of time, you're going to not have to be forced to fast. You're just going to do it naturally. So uh, again, no studies that I'm aware of, um, but it's definitely something that as carnivore continues to become popular in the mainstream, I'm sure some researchers will get a hold of. I'm sure Sean Baker would love to hear your idea uh, because I know he's in the know with a lot of the researchers who are starting to look at carnivore diets and, uh, and fasting. Jack says, I once had a friend publicly on Facebook accuse me of having an eating disorder when I said I was fasting. Um, nope. <laughs> Uh, yeah, this is the thing I talked about uh, this week in one of the rants was if you're going to go on a fast, by God, by all means, please do not tell people you're going on a fast because they do. They'll say you have an eating disorder. They'll say you're starving yourself. They'll say, oh my God, that's unhealthy. And it's just uneducated people. And you're always going to have those people. And again, the reason people think fasting is so funky monkey is... We live in a fed society, not a fasting society. We live in food availability. I'm literally within three miles of just about any cuisine you could possibly want. And within three miles of six grocery stores or stores where I could get food, uh, there's a farmer's market stand over that way. And so many fast food restaurants, so many sit down restaurants, it's just everything you could think of. Um, and, and two bo uh, big box stores where you can buy all kind of junk food and all kind of stuff. So with that kind of food availability, fasting seems so odd. <clears throat> so when you say, I'm not eating for a period of time, people just go, why? They don't understand the why, but most certainly not an eating disorder. Um, I hate the term egg fast too. If you're uh, taking in calories, it's not a fast. Yeah, I, I actually came up with that term, but the original term that I used when I started talking about it was not egg fast. People changed it to egg fast over time. I actually called it an egg fest, F-E-S-T, uh, when I was doing my experiment looking at just eating eggs uh, cooked in butter with maybe some cheese. So an egg fest was what I called it. But then over time, people, oh, Jimmy Moore's egg fast. And I was like, oh, okay, yeah, definitely not fasting. Just because it's got fasting in the title does not mean that it is the kind of fasting we're talking about and the kind of fasting we're doing here this week on Jimmy Rants. Um, many of us do it naturally because we aren't hungry. You're hungry for meat, but abstaining from food. Oh, okay. Kelly, I hear you. I definitely think that that kind of research would be something of interest to Dr. Sean Baker. Uh, definitely look him up here on uh, Instagram. I'm sure he would love to hear your, your idea. Uh, would love to see the research for the difference between 100% carnivores who fast versus those who don't. Again, I think, I think most carnivores do at least some intermittent fasting, but it would be interesting if they did it like who eats carnivore and then goes on like three days of fasting and then go back goes back to carnivore versus those who just stay carnivore all the time and maybe intermittent fast only. That would be an interesting kind of uh, let's compare. Um, Jillian wants to know if keto chow uh, made with heavy cream would be an okay thing to break my fast with. Yeah, I've used keto chow before. Uh, I love their shakes, uh, and I'm a big fan of it. In fact, they created a, a, a website uh, that makes it easy for you to find them. Jimmy loves ketochow.com if you want to check them out. But um, yeah, I think keto chow is just enough of a soft food that, that would be a re-entry to your stomach. We'll talk more about breaking your fast over the weekend uh, as people are coming up on the end of their fast. But yes, to answer your question, keto chow, heavy cream, definitely a great way to have that first little bit of food. Usually you want to break your fast with just something a little um, 
which the other day when I broke mine at 52, I had some cheese, just a little bit of cheese, like four or five slices of cheese, just to kind of get things flowing again. And then my main meal was a rotisserie chicken. Um, so yes, if you're gonna use keto chow, let that be the little bit of food one hour before you eat and then have your meal. So good job. Uh, Thomas DeLauer has a great video on best foods for women to break your fast with. Cool. Yeah, I know in our book, the only uh, food that, that Dr. Fung um, was very cautious about breaking your fast with is eggs because he's found in his patient population, those who ate eggs, it tended to like stop them up and they had pain from that. Um, so I have he's freaked me out about trying to use eggs to break a fast now, but um, I don't want to be the guinea pig that says, yeah, you're right, dude. Ah! Not going to do that. So <laughs> that's the only contraindication that I've seen. All right. Thank you, Instagram. Let's pop back over to my YouTube uh, or going to go back to Facebook, then YouTube. Keep the questions coming. We still have a half an hour, you guys, so you better keep asking questions or we're going to have a very boring show here. Nancy says, can you discuss autophagy benefits of fasting and do you get benefits on shorter fasts like 18 and 20 hour fasts? So yeah, at the very beginning, I did read from three articles uh, that talked about auto autophagy, but basically this is the reason I think you need to do extended fasting. This is why I love these seven day fasting challenges that we do together is because I think you get a huge autophagy benefit. So for those of you that are new to that language, autophagy is basically the cleaning up of old cells that are just floating around in your body. People don't realize this, but your body is full of some junk. Like you've thought about, or you've heard about like space junk and all this stuff just kind of floating out there in space. There's space junk within your body that's just dead cells that just sit there and float around aimlessly with nowhere to go. And the only way they found that you can clean those up and vacuum those out of your body is doing periods of extended fasting. Now, you said uh, shorter fast, like 18 to 20 hours. Yes, you get a little bit of autophagy when you do those. Any, t any period of time where you're not eating, you're getting a little bit of autophagy. But a lot of the scientists and the researchers are saying, you know what, you kind of need to push it to 72 hours to really kickstart that autophagy and let, let really letting those things get cleared out of the body. And of course, when you clear all of that, it makes room for new cells to come in, which can make your skin more vibrant, which can give you more energy, it could do a lot of really just cool things, which is why you want to produce this autophagy. So for those of you still in this seven day fasting challenge or in day number five, you've been getting now for about uh, a day and a half to two days, some really intensive cleaning up of the cells. And by the end of seven days of fasting, you've pretty well cleaned up most of those dead cells that were just hanging around in the body with nowhere to go. So that's a huge benefit uh, to doing that. Rhonda wants to know, what do you get from fasting beyond seven days? Great, great, great question. I have done three 21 day fasts um, and I can tell you from a subjective level, and this is just my own personal experience, uh, when I go over seven days, I think you get kind of the law of diminishing returns. It's not to say that it's bad if you want to go more than seven days. I don't think you're harming yourself. I definitely don't think you need to go too much longer if you're going to go a long, long, long time. I don't think you need to go too much longer than like two to three weeks. But I think most people get the majority of their benefits from fasting from doing a one week fast. And here, and I, I talked about this a little bit earlier in the week that when you fast for seven days, you get uh, to fast again a lot quicker than if you fasted for say 14 days, you'd have to wait a little while longer. And I think it's the cumulative effects of the fasts over time. So fast for seven days here, then take like, you know, four to six weeks off, fast another seven days, four to six weeks off, another seven days, four to six weeks off, rather than fast for two weeks, take two months off. Fast for two weeks, take two months off. You're gonna get in more opportunities for fasting if you limit it to seven days because you get the most bang for your buck in those seven days. Because after seven, you kind of get the law of diminishing returns. But again, 
if you're feeling good after day seven and you want to keep it going, I've done this before, uh, where I ha I set a goal of seven and I end up going nine because you feel good. And then at some point you go, okay, time to end it, and it's no big deal. So you're in complete control of that whole process. Nancy says, I've been reading and seeing articles pushing shorter fasts for autophagy. I didn't think they were very fact-based. Yeah, you get a little bit of autophagy from shorter fast, but the vast majority of the cleaning up process that you get that would that would come from autophagy has to come from longer fast, starting at about the 72 hour mark of fasting, which is why we push for seven days. All right, thank you guys over on Facebook. Let's go back over to YouTube. Um, Shirley says she's down to 48 hours left in her seven days. Good job. Patricia wants to know, is hot lemon water in the morning on a fasting day breaking your fast? No. Lemon water is non-caloric. Uh, and if it gives you some kind of like satiety and some kind of satisfaction because you had some lemon water, um, go for it. The only thing I would caution about anything acidic like lemon water would be that the uh, acidicness may cause some disturbance in your stomach because you're not you don't have any food in there. Um, and an acid usually is helping to digest the foods, helps to boost the hydrochloric acid in the stomach. So if you're putting an acid and acidic kind of lemon juice in there and there's no food to digest, you may start to get gurgles and grumbles and stuff. But I've also heard people say that it kind of helps settle things down. So my advice would be just give it a go and see how you feel and see how you do. Uh, and definitely let me know how that works for you. I, I don't use citrus in the midst of doing a fast. Um, so I have no idea personally on that. Thank you, YouTube. Let's pop back over to my Instagram page. We are doing Ask Me Anything, you guys. Fasting questions only. So keep them coming. We still have probably about 25 more minutes here today on Jimmy Rants. Berkeley says, although I broke my fast yesterday, I plan to fast for 48 hours and then feed again, then I will try either alternate day fasting or just continue intermittent fasting. Thank you, Berkeley, and great job on your fast, by the way. Um, those of you that are doing the seven-day fast or have gone pretty deep into the seven-day fast, you want to keep the benefits of the fast going. Berkeley is right. You want to try to implement strategies of fasting that would keep the same benefits going. So, Let's say you make it all the way to the end of seven days, or even you made it five days if you end it today, or you end it tomorrow at six days. You wanna keep those benefits going. Definitely intermittent fast, and it probably will happen naturally. People think they end a fast, and suddenly they will be eating everything in sight, and it just doesn't work that way. The funny part about fasting, coming off of an extended fast, is the next day you wake up and you're just like, okay, I don't feel like eating and you go most of the day and I don't feel like eating, you're fasting again and you don't even realize it because the body's kind of going, oh yeah, this is familiar, we don't have to eat. So your body's probably gonna naturally intermittent fast, but her strategy, I love what she's talking about there, is to do alternate day fasting. And again, uh, Dr. Fung and I talked about this in our book, The Complete Guide to Fasting, that if you wanna keep the benefits of your extended fast going, when you break your fast and you have your meals the next day, the day after that, fast. And then the day after that, eat your regular meals. And the day after that, fast. It's called alternate day fasting. So if you do seven days worth of total water and salt only fasting, follow it up with feast, fast, feast, fast, feast, fast. And, and then that way you kind of keep those benefits going. And you may not see as much weight gain happen, you may not see a spike in the blood sugar uh, and other things that would be negative. You wanna keep all those benefits going. I would definitely love for someone to test what's happening with autophagy when you keep those benefits going with alternate day fasting as well. Mm. Beth says, I broke a two day fast with eggs one time and I was doubled over in pain. Yeah, that's what Dr. Fung was worried about because he's seen it again and again from so many people who have done fasting and tried to break it with eggs. Kat says they need to find out uh, how to measure autophagy. Are they working on it? As far as I know, Kat, 
No, I am not aware of any way that they measure autophagy. You would think it would be kind of easy to detect those proteins that are in the body uh, that are just floating around. Uh, surely somebody can come up with a way to detect that and how much. Because then you'd know when you need to fast. Like how, how clued in could you be if you had an aut autophagy meter that would let you know, okay, yeah, dude, you need some autophagy to happen. Um, which is why a lot of us fast kind of on the regular, just so we don't have to measure, but it would be good to know. But as far as I know, no, they're not working on it that I know of uh, and definitely have not seen it. Uh, simple natured mama, are most black teas okay during a fast? I drink a mango tea, but wasn't sure if I could drink it when I'm not in my eating window. Tea is probably fine just as black coffee is as long as it's non-sweetened and non-caloric. Uh, some of those flavored teas can uh, tend to have some calories from, from sugar or even, even artificial sweeteners, which are no-nos. They're going to definitely uh, make you hungry. But yeah, black tea is perfectly fine. Black coffee is fine. Um, anything that's just non-caloric. Now, some people report... And this is just for your FYI. Some people report that the caffeine in coffee and the caffeine in tea uh, does stoke hunger. So just be aware of that, that you might get a hunger response from drinking black tea. But if you get uh, enjoyment out of having black tea, I would tell you green tea is probably a better one. I know Dr. Fung uh, helped to develop a fasting tea that's called peak tea. Uh, and they definitely put some like uh, hunger quelling type things into that tea, P-I-Q-U-E-T, uh, if you want to Google that and look that up. But yeah, black tea is fine. All righty, keep the questions coming, Instagram. I'm going to pop back over, see if we got anything new. I don't see anything new on Facebook. And then pop over here. Don't see anything new. So are you guys all fasting questioned out? <laughs> Surely not. Like usually during the week when I'm doing these Jimmy rants, people have all kinds of questions about fasting. I guess we have been talking about fasting for a little while. So maybe some of those questions. In fact, I'm going to challenge all of you. I want you to ask me a question about fasting that you think I've never heard before. Because I've literally heard most everything. Uh, but I would love to see if you have a question that you think I've never heard before. And I'll let you know. Uh, Alice says, in my opinion, that peak tea is not good, uh, especially for the price. Okay, yeah, I, I've literally never tried it, to be honest with you. I don't need that. Give me water, which by the way, everybody get your water. Water, 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 water. Dilly, dilly, drink. Um... So I've never tried peak tea in the midst of doing a fast myself. So no personal experience with that. So really have no opinion about whether it is worth it or not for the price. So no more questions. Okay. Well, you guys are party poopers. <laughs> Just kidding. Well, uh, keep it going. If you are still fasting, we really appreciate you sticking with this. I am going to keep supporting you guys here uh, on Jimmy Rants uh, over the weekend. And so thanks for being here. Berkeley has a question. I knew somebody would come through. She wants to know, does age affect a fast? Does it get harder as you age? So as with anything, your metabolism uh, kind of plays a little bit of havoc on you as you get older. Um, and I would think that fasting would, at least from a, uh, a logical standpoint, would get a little bit harder as you age because you're the one that has uh, typically when you're older, not you specifically, Berkeley, but people in general um, would have trouble because of just the naturalness of insulin resistance and metabolic uh, disturbances and things going on. So, But if you're relatively healthy and your metabolism is great, you're eating keto, for example, um, I think that all bets are off. Age doesn't matter. But if you're just the average older person, I think the older you are, you probably are going to have a tough time with this, just like you'd have a tough time with keto. But ironically, those are the people who need it the most. So yes, harder, but yes, you need it. Kat says a knowledgeable audience. Exactly. 
I'm never going to complain that you you know uh, things and you don't. I, I want to make it where you don't need me anymore to answer questions. So this is wonderful. Uh, Rhonda says, I don't feel like drinking too much. Should I force it? No, no, no. Don't force drinking. Um, is it because the water just doesn't taste good? What What's the issue that you don't feel like drinking too much? I would say use it. Uh, you don't have to gut, you know, guzzle it you don't have to like you don't have to you know gulp it down but if you want to have uh more water i think it's always a good idea and especially in the context of fasting people devalue how fasting can quell hunger and cravings and how fasting can make you feel full so uh no don't feel like you have to force it ever 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 i love the peak tea have it every morning just tastes like cinnamon. Cool. After my 21 day fast, I had bloody liquid mucus stools. Any reason why? I am not a doctor. I'm not going to attempt to answer why you had bloody stools, but I would say that was something else going on besides fasting. I've literally never heard anybody have bloody stools from fasting, but um, thanks for that visual, Norma. Ew. Mike says, why is it considered wrong to fast through the weekdays and feast on the weekends, then fast again for another five days and just keep that up for a month or more. Uh, Mike, I think that's a great idea. In fact, I have considered doing that kind of a protocol. Um, usually it's the opposite. Usually it's the eat keto for five days, then fast on the weekends. But I say flip it. If you want to do uh, eat uh, or fast for five days and then eat keto on the weekends, I think that would be fine for a period of time, as you said. So um, yeah, give it a go, man. I, and I think the concern would be, well, over time, you're not getting enough nutrition and you might be nutrient deficient. But if you're doing it for like a month, I don't think it's going to be the end of the world. Uh, Nancy says, got most of my answers from your book. Yes. Yeah, so maybe a lot of you have read the complete guide to fasting and you don't need to ask me more questions, but really appreciate it. By the way, this is on Amazon uh, in paperback, Kindle, and I read the audiobook version of it. So check it out. All right, I saw something come in over here. Oh, Kat had another. It's harder to make change the older you are. So we have to start young as a habit. That's true, Kat. That's true. All right, guys, thank you so much for being here on this special Ask Me Anything Fasting Edition. Uh, I always love answering your general questions uh, uh, about things, and so fasting today kind of ruled the roost. We will definitely keep the fasting up for the rest of the weekend. And those of you still doing this, stay encouraged, keep at it, don't give up. Um, it will be uh, it will be so worth it when you get to that end, especially if you've never done seven days before. Uh, Alice says in a Zoom meeting on Dr. Fung's membership site, they said you can do five five days, eat keto two days for eight weeks, but only do that once a year. Yeah, you want to keep it limited. So did you hear that, Mike? So uh, Dr. Fong noted that you can do that five days of fasting with two days of keto on the weekend for up to eight weeks uh, in the year. So uh, don't do it indefinitely, but definitely for a period of time. So thank you for that information, Alice. Really appreciate that. And that's it for this episode of Jimmy Rants. JimmyRants.com is the website. As always, you can engage live in the content, but you got to go follow me right here, Instagram, at LivinLowCarbMan, L-I-V-I-N-L-O-W-C-A-R-B-M-A-N. Once you're there, engage live in the content. Then we also simulcast over here on my Facebook page. So thank you guys for being here. Finally, we also love having our YouTubers on the live stream. Thank you guys all for being here today on Jimmy Rants. If you missed the live here on Instagram, when we are done here today, it will be up on IGTV for replay on demand. Uh, I usually pop that on uh, with a little bit of notes onto my Instagram page so you never miss an episode. Just scroll back through my old uh, Instagrams and you can see uh, the posts of the past episodes if you wanna watch that. We also throw them up over on YouTube. Type in the keyword Jimmy Ranch, you'll find the show. Finally, go to jimmyrants.com and you have all the past episodes housed there. We also have a Patreon page if you want to throw a few pennies our way to show your appreciation for what we do here on Jimmy Rants. That's it for now, you guys. We'll be back again real soon. Bye. All right.